Thank you so much. And it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, we're really enjoying the, the site and the weather and the context um, here today. Um, I wanted to start and I'm going to give you a snapshot of our practice and the projects that we're working on, but also some of the other um, activities that our practice has um, taken on. And, and um, I've had the chance to really think about this in, in the, over the past year, mainly because we were preparing for an exhibit at the Art Institute of Chicago, which is up uh, through February 24th, if anyone's in the city, um, this, this show is on, on our work. It, it really started about uh, two years ago when Zoe Ryan, one of the curators, um, came to me and said, we'd like to do this exhibition on your work at Living Architects. Um, and we started discussing it then. And my goal, I thought, the idea I had at the time was um, perhaps we could show people what architects do in a different way by actually you know, bringing ourselves, our practice, to the museum. So the first concept was we were going to really transport our entire office to the museum. They have about 4,000 square feet and um, set up our, our office remotely there. That did not fly with the uh, commissioners of the museum. I guess um, the I guess one of the problems is you can't actually make money while in a not-for-profit institution like the Art Institute. So and hopefully we would be making money. So we decided not to do that. Um, instead, uh, we designed uh, the exhibition curated by Zoe Ryan and Karen Kais um, into these two spaces. This is in the Renzo Piano. Um, edition. And, and one of the things that struck me was that, you know, in, in, in art, like right across the hall from this exhibit, you can come face to face with the painting and be in front of the authentic object that, it, you're, that is moving you. In, in architecture, it's much harder because you're always representing something that's outside the museum walls. And so we, we wanted to do a physical installation um, in the first room. This is what we call these rope rooms. There are um, projects displayed around the walls, and then there are more interactive things within these spaces so people can actually you know, be in a spatial configuration that's defined by these virtually straight lines um, suspended from the ceiling. In the second room, uh, we really wanted to, again, bring the, the process and the practice of architecture into the museum and and kind of expose what it takes to do projects. So we, we basically set up a, a representation of our studio that has a lot of things in it. And in, in preparing this part, I think we really were able to think about our own process in order to be able to tell it to others. And so in that room, you find full-scale mock-ups. You find um, books. Uh, one of the first things that we do when we're starting a project is develop a reading list. Um, and these might be books, not just architectural books, but references that come from different places. Uh, this is just a collection of books for one project we, were, we recently completed. On, again, animal architecture on the top of the pile. Um, um, that was for the Northern Island. Um, but what the reading lists help us do is, um, you know, projects start and stop and they will stop for two years and then they start again. But with these reading lists, people working on the projects can jump in if we pick up the project two years later um, and some of the students or new interns starting on the project weren't there for the beginning design piece. They're able to catch up with the reading list and, and work with it just like it's a brand new uh, project. And it, it kind of keeps the design process alive throughout. Mock-ups and experiments, we, we work a lot with physical materials. Um, you know, one of the things today is everyone has a laser cutter, but we've found that that really tends to flatten out um, our work. We try to work with the materials that the project, or similar materials to what uh, the project will be made of. Um, sometimes full-scale mock-ups right inside the studio. Um, tools and instruments, we have a display in the show about not just tools, meaning digital tools, I think we overemphasize digital tools, but we're in this uneven period uh, in architecture right now where there, there's an opportunity to use kind of old school tools and new school tools at the same time. Um, and so we want to leverage that, this moment where we have the access to all of those things. Um, 
we also have just a lot of random collections of curiosities in the office. One of them is um, actually Mark's crazy file, things that come across our desks that are from newspaper clippings. And, and that builds up a body of interests that might you could deploy at some time. It's not necessarily known what you're going to use it for, like, uh, but it really does help to um, stimulate our own uh, curiosities and to provide us with almost like a, a, a toolkit for deploying it at a moment's no notice. Um, finally, there's really the public discussion and engagement aspect of our pro of our office, which we do a lot of internal. This is an uh, archie salon that we did internally. Um, in this case, talking about the issue of ownership, um, that was moderated by Eker Gill. We we invite people into our studio. We've done eco salons there. Um, we also more and more have uh, started to engage. The public in the design process and it's not something I, I think I can speak to with authority yet we're in, in the process of learning how to do that and how to make that a meaningful exercise so um, our office is located here in Wicker Park um, it's a it's the second floor of this building it's really this collaborative place um, people live nearby the, the, all the architects live nearby bike to work if you need a wig, you can buy one of those too across the street. Um, but it, it's it's a very active area, and I, I think what we've learned is since our practice has started to be more um, international or doing projects internationally, you know, it, it even becomes more and more important to have this uh, presence locally and to study things locally. Um, so it it's it's but through that that we're able to work um, in a in a broader context. I grew up, um, I'm the daughter of a civil engineer, and um, my, my father is a civil engineer, my mother is a librarian, and, um, but our vacations really consisted of driving around the country to look at bridges. But that was like, you know, um, so we, were, we would look at anything, you know, not even just spectacular bridges, anything that, um, so the, the infra infrastructure is really kind of a core thing of our office today even, but different kinds of infrastructure. We usually did this in a car, that was our car, Grand Safari, but it, it also meant that we saw, I saw a lot of landscapes and loved the west and and really was in, um, really greatly influenced by seeing things like Mesa Verde and places like that um, in the West. And then, of course, there's the city of Chicago, which is our home city and, and such an inspiration in terms of the architecture, the tall buildings, et cetera. Um, an, an increasing concern for us is what happens outside the city center and, and how, um, how to make cities more viable, I guess, um, going forward. In addition to these kind of influences, um, I've been teaching adjunct Mark as well at, at IIT over the years, since, I think for me, since 97. And at IIT, a lot of the courses I was teaching were through materials. So the students still start with, um, they take masonry, wood, construction, steel, and concrete. And, and that really has had a profound impact on the way that I see my own work which is, you know, a lot of times starting with the material. Uh, this was an early project um, that we did at the National Building Museum. It was an installation um, that was uh, sponsored by the International Masonry Institute, asking us to kind of reconsider stone as a building material. What could we do with it today? Um, and one of the first things we found out was that the museum floor couldn't support much weight. In other words, do a stone exhibition about stone, but make it light. <laughs> and so um, uh, um, what we found was, we, this was a, one of the gallery space, we were able to think about, I mean, the whole thing was about, is it possible for stone to be put into tension? That was our basic question. It really wasn't about anything else, you know, and, and, and to do, just to do that uh, took a lot of collaborations with engineers, amazing engineers, stone masons, um, and, and physical testing of materials, you know, given, given the new tools and, and different composite, would it be possible? So this piece was about 680 different shapes of stone, um, each one hanging from the one above, suspended from the museum's ceiling. 
and each stone, it, these were tiles, so they're only about three eighths of an inch thick. Um, and again, the way we started this was just going down the basement of IIT and starting breaking the material. When you always learn more about breaking about materials if you break it than than uh, if you just leave it sitting on the desk. So we, we took these these are different geometries and different um, um, different types of stone. Also, it turns out that the the marble was actually performing very well because you know marble it, it, it's formed under pressure. It's almost like it acts like fluid. Um, as opposed to like a granite, which has quartz uh, pieces in it that, that can tend to fracture. So we found that, you know, the, I guess the professor down in the lab had never seen architects coming into his lab before, his aerospace lab. And um, he predicted that the stone would break at about um, 120 pounds. We were able to, with certain types of stone, get up to about 1,750 pounds. Um, and and then that gave us enough confidence to go forward to design this uh, piece. This is the false work that went up first. Uh, the, here's the mason starting at the top for the first time in his life. He's usually building things from the bottom up. <laughs> and uh, this first course made of a, of a high strength aluminum. Um, and then each piece hanging from the one above it. And this is um, the piece installed. And the pieces have so the, each tile was backed with a uh, fiberglass backing um, similar to laminations and glass so that if anything broke, it would stick together. But then they're installed, one hanging from the one above it. And then it's also acting like a shell. So it's, it's resisting lateral loads uh, because of the overall global shape of it. That was that. I think, uh, so starting with materials, even just very basic materials, this is a small house made with brick. Um, it actually was a 100-year-old a um, a uh, carriage house that started out as a, a farmhouse and carriage house <laughs> storage building, and uh, which was pretty dilapidated. The owners uh, wanted to save as much as they could. We saved about 30% of the original walls, but we took down the, the, the front wall and rebuilt it as a, this diaphanous screen. Um, backed up with steel. It's, a, it's an open garden, so it's open at the top, but it's only a single wide thick. And um, it, the, the innovation is really in the, the hardware, the very customized small hardware that allows the wall to move in certain directions and not others. And it really, it's south facing, so it's really acting as this kind of filter for the light and the garden outside the, the entry to the home and the, and the dining space. Um, recently, I've been doing a lot of projects with wood. I really like wood. Um, it's great for the environment. It, it, instead of producing <coughs> carbon, you know, like firing it and producing uh, carbon, it actually sequesters it. Um, one project was this recently, the Lingen Park Zoo Nature Boardwalk. And, and this is interesting because it's um, in addition to being uh, the use of wood, it's also a whole site project that acts as green infrastructure for the city. Um, this was a rendering early on. Uh, the, the pavilion is using um, a bent wood technology that I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, and I should say that this pond um, that was associated with, it, it was actually owned by the park district and the Lincoln Park Zoo is a zoo a free zoo that is is in the park. Um, they wanted to take over this pond and improve it and um, lease it from the city for 50 years. And uh, what was there was this is a Cafe Brower. It's a really interesting historic building mm -hmm. on this pond. And the, but the interesting thing about the pond is it was designed just to be a picturesque pond reflecting pool uh, in the middle of the city. And what we've done with it is kind of redefine it as something that is both a habitat and a uh, green infrastructure project. The three foot deep pond was becoming very smelly, let's say, and um, kind of dysfunctional. Um, so one of the first things was the, the water quality. And with the, with the water, with hydrology engineers, we came up with an idea to make it like down to 20 feet deep as opposed to three feet deep. And that way, fish can winter over in it and the, the oxygen level goes up in the water. As well, we 
we um, we found out it was actually getting its water from the city drinking water supply. So in other words, the city was cleaning the water up to the level you could drink it and then just putting it into this outdoor pond. Um, so part of the project was trying to disconnect it from the drinking supply and just let the runoff water refill the pond. So we were we uh, designed the edge so that the green um, edge could filter the water. And then, of course, how do people engage with this place through a boardwalk and the pavilion, which is an education pavilion. Um, the individual pieces of the pavilion are, are sized so that one person can pick them up and move them. <coughs> they are actually curved in two directions. So it's, it's a glue laminate process. Um, with, it's like a micro laminated members, um, and it was the first time this was used in uh, in the U.S. This particular method, so we did have to go through a lot of the structural testing to get the the approvals, um, and then it's kept water water is kept out through these translucent domes that are made out of a fiberglass um, that that are allow the light to come in. Again, with our model making, we really try to. Uh, study the actual materials instead of just uh, getting this 3D printed. Um, we did work with wetting materials and bending it um, and to develop the project, but together with some very sophisticated uh, 3D modeling. Um, the the mock up here shows how large each of the pieces are, and here you can see it under construction. Um, so, really, I think it, it gives a nice sense of how the wood can be, the, the qualities of it, which is its bendability and its, and its um, strength in both uh, compression and tension. So that this was the first year the, the pond opened. And since then, it has really started to fill out. And you know, a lot of people think that at first, you know, this looks a little bit scruffy compared to how it looked before, but it's it really starting to thrive and function as, as, a, as a habitat um, with a lot of different types of, of uh, migratory birds coming through um, and animals. So, I mean, one, this is a constant concern, I think, for us has been how um, the, the biodiversity is maintained in cities. Um, reason being is, you know, as we know, cities, pop, people are moving to cities. Um, We've heard it a million times that over 50% of, of the population lives in cities today, and that number is going up. But we're, you know, we're also moving toward uh, a figure of 8 billion people on the planet. At the same time, we're losing a lot of species um, going through the Holocene extinction period. And so as the city footprint, I mean, one thing that people don't talk about that much is that the city fo footprint keeps getting bigger and bigger. It's harder and harder to get pathways through them. Uh, we know that pathways exist. This is a, an image of um, a migratory bird paths that come through Chicago called the Mississippi Flyway. Um, and, um, but how to design our city so that they can be you know, part of these pathways. At the Lincoln Park Zoo, there are um, a number of species that are using it as a rookery and a, as a stopping point on their migration. And, and that's and kids to get close to, so it's really you know kind of an enriching aspect. But there's also species that use it when we don't see them, like these coyotes. I think there are something like 2,000 coyotes they found um, within the city of Chicago, and and they are using it at night, and um, also you know moving through the area. And the benefit is keeping the rat population down. Um, um, so I think it's pretty exciting to see it working in this way. And of course, for people, it's, it's a lot of fun to go there day and night um, and, and engage with these things. The second wood project is the Writer's Theater um, that we are in design for right now. Um, it should start construction um, at late next year. Um, it's, it's a small theater in, in the town of, well, in the suburb of Glencoe, which is just north of Chicago. Um, here we're using wood as well. And I think the sensitive thing about this project was just that uh, it's, it's kind of a, the, the community has a lot of architecture. Actually, it's very eclectic. There's all different kinds of architecture. But they see themselves as a community that is, has historic architecture. And 
you know, a lot of it is um, actually in the Tudor style. Um, and we wanted to build, you know, a very contemporary theater in the space. So in the beginning of this project, we really started looking at um, what the history of Glencoe was. And it turns out, like many places you know, in the Midwest, it, it, it was first used as a logging um, site because it, it was forested. Uh, they would cut down the trees and float them down the um, great, you know, along Lake Michigan. Um, and so they were harvesting wood there. So it was originally very wooded. Um, over time, it became farms and then later um, went back to being suburb and it's kind of being rewooded. But what we discovered, which I thought was pretty exciting, was that, you know, looking at this Tudor architecture, um, there is a, con a convergence between Tudor architecture, which is really like the first frame buildings, if you think about it, the modern frame, the notion of a, of a frame, um, and logging that occurred in England at the time. But at the same time, that was a period when the best of this modern theater um, became prominent. Shakespearean theater and a lot of the, the theaters like the Globe and the Rose and the Theater Project were all Tudor buildings. So we, we, we kind of latched onto this notion of the frame, the wood frame, and brought that to the project. We also were looking at, uh, with the theaters, how some of the most exciting theater happened in streets and you know, outside the theater space. So in, in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see our design that where we're trying to actually make the, the lobby space um, a space where impromptu performance can happen as well in, in addition to the two um, design theater spaces. One of the design theater spaces is a 250-seat um, thrust stage, which we're reusing a lot of material from a building uh, that was on the site for the interior. Um, the other space is a 99-seat theater. Here's an image of the building with this box, this wooden, tu it's like a tutor without plaster between the spaces, <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, a floating kind of lantern box, but, but bringing this timber construction more into institutional spaces and, um, um, and, and making it work and do double duty. Here, here's a view from the roof, and you can see in the model how this, this kind of semi-indoor um, public space of, of the lobby becomes um, almost like an urban space with a gallery that, that surrounds it that's actually hanging um, using the wood boat. So we're using the wood as both the trust members and the attention members here. It's a view of what it will look like inside. Here's another one. Um, and so I think that's, that project really, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, all of us, we're working with wood in different ways. Um, in the most kind of advanced ways. But uh, the next project I want to show you is a project where we're actually reviving an old way to use wood. Um, it's for the Kalamazoo College. It's the Arcus Center for Social Justice Leadership uh, that will that just started construction in Kalamazoo. This, this project, um, it's, it's an institutional project. It's on a college campus uh, for a college that has a very strong pro program where students study social justice. And um, they wanted a conference center meeting space uh, for their program. And interestingly, the, this is, this is their, their campus, and it's kind of wedged in between a uh, residential area, um, a kind of in, in, um, residential area, another campus actually nearby, and, and um, some infrastructure. And so, the, the design of this campus is primarily in the style of um, neo-colonial, let's say. <laughs> and uh, it didn't really seem to fit with our social justice program. Um, so we, what we, and actually we didn't really know what the social justice program was going to be about. We actually wanted to see, you know, there really aren't any buildings designed with that as a main uh, function. So we started out by looking at where social justice takes place in the world, you know, and what kind of spaces does it need. And ur urbanistically, the street is, you know, it's the most important space for social justice activities, human rights, um, 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 gay, lesbian issues, um, different kinds of, of 
social justice activities have always taken place on, in the street. You can see this image of um, Zuccotti Park in New York where um, Occupy movement took, took hold. And one, one that was really interesting to us that was simultaneous with the design process was looking at this space of Tahrir Square um, during the Arab Spring. And, and the, there was a, a tool on CNN website where you could actually go in and see how people were using this big urban space. And it was, it was really interesting because you could zoom in to see where um, people were eating, where they were getting medical services, how they um, slept over in the square, where they prayed, all these things. And, and that is, you know, an, a fascinating design without, without architects, I guess, and just kind of um, self-organized. We looked also at some buildings that were meeting spaces, and, and this is a traditional house that is used for meeting of the elders, and it, it's designed so that the ceiling is very low, so you can't get mad and stand up and yell at someone else, you have to <laughs> stay civil. Um, there were also meeting houses around, uh, we, we were pretty much looking at ways people meet, ways people um, discuss issues, how do you create um, equality but allow there to be difference. Um, a Native American longhouse is also a good example. A lot of times there's uh, fire or water in the middle. This is a, a step well in, in India, which is used for ritual, but also community space and meeting space. So as I said, um, all of these ideas didn't really jive with this campus architecture that was on <laughs> already there. Um, so, so what we found was we were able to um, associate the building more with the wooded grove that was on campus. And so here you can see, see if I can use my pointer. Um, well, there's a grove to the south of the building. So at the bottom, there is this very densely uh, wooded area right in the middle of campus. And we kind of tied our building to that piece. Um, and in a, in a sense, we're able to disengage from the post um, the colonial um, architecture. Inside the building, there's it's organized in it with the central space. We were taking a lot of cues from these places we saw. There's places for um, cooking food, which is a great way to break down barriers. There's uh, lots of different styles of meeting spaces. Um, there are even the restrooms. We really rethought like how to do the restroom so that they wouldn't be. Um, uh, I guess, categorize you as male or female. There's, there's so, so much variation in between. And so the restrooms we designed, I think we would probably take that going forward into other projects, but it's really interesting. And, and we were able to work very closely with this client who was so in tune with social justice issues. Uh, we um, came up with this, with the, the plan is kind of this trifoil plan where each of the big windows on the ends um, is is um, associated with the different landscapes around, like the grove, the residential, and the campus. And then the, the concave sides of the building create different landscapes as well. And as we, as we were doing this, we're simultaneously looking around the, the, the site in Michigan. We found that there was white cedar um, groves that are really good for uh, building because they were resistant to rot. And that's the, the range of, of the white cedar the green area. And this is a really good building material. And at the same time, we discovered these barns, which are uh, using wood in a really interesting way. I had never seen these before, but, but um, wood is used as a masonry material. And it's probably Scandinavian, actually, but it, it's you'd find these 100-year-old barns in Michigan using this. And not only barns, but some commercial buildings like this one, um, uses it as well. This has since been a renovated in the building and the, a two-story wall that's in perfect shape. Up close, it's really beautiful too because it's, it's using the wood and kind of, I thought in a way, expressing the individuality of the wood um, in the same way a human face expresses the individuality of a person. So then we wanted to see, well, you know, what could be done with it if we could revive this technique and we were able to find someone who knew how to do it, who was, had been doing um, saunas, building in saunas for 30 years. If we could bring him in, learn the technique, teach it to our contractors, what, could, what else could be done with it? 
Um, so we, we started to explore this again model in the office using warping surfaces, um, doing a lot of things that you can do with masonry construction, but here it's wood. Um, we, we attended a, a workshop with our, our leader, that's Rob Roy, uh, the guy with the gray hair there, um, and, and we brought our contractors with us. So at the same time we're learning it and understanding what's going on, they were learning it as well. And this is our studio members like creating a sauna <laughs> and using it. They actually, use, if, it, if it's a through wall construction, they use sawdust as the thermal break, which is interesting. And then here's our, our model for our building. Um, there's a little skylight at the top um, and, and each of the, so there's a steel, in our case we're using it like, like you would with brick masonry. There's a frame and it's tied back to the frame, but you get extra added thermal insulation and it's sequestering carbon. So we're going to close the building up so the inside and the outside can be done simultaneously um, using some um, techniques that the builders knew to, to pre-sort the, the wood in the various sizes and then it will start to go up and you know hopefully the students can also participate at least in part of this uh, project. And that's what it will look like from the campus. Okay and then finally I, I have two more things I want to just talk a little bit about research as it as it applies to typologies and in this case our, our tower research which is a little bit ongoing um, and then talk go back to that public engagement piece. Um, so again back to the show at the Art Institute we started to, um, the, the curators wanted to use our towers um, in part of the show to talk about density and um, one, one thing that we had addressed early on with our work at Aqua was to, to understand, you know, what, what does the density of vertical living mean? Um, <coughs> we took a, just a snapshot of just the typical Chicago suburb on the right and the footprint of the tower, our Aqua Tower on the left, and um, found out that, you know, you know basically you're, you're putting a lot more people into a smaller footprint but that actually does translate into the carbon footprint as well. And uh, research done by the, the um, a number of, of um, research institutes, um, like for example, the Chicago um, Center for Green Technology, have have assigned um, a carbon number to the different <coughs> patterns of living. So on the right, uh, a typical household would probably be producing about seven times the carbon as someone who's living in a tall building, you know, given that they're working in the city that they're living in. <coughs> so there was that aspect to it, but besides just thinking about, you know, why, why are towers potentially good, you know, these days, you know, there's also this aspect of they're exciting and um, we want to be in them. And so there, were, there was a, a search in our office to think about, you know, what the potential of a tower would be. Um, from an experiential level. Um, one of the first drawings, I guess, and, and this went along with the model, was this almost like a topographic drawing of the tower. And we created on the, this drawing um, hills and valleys, um, and that we associated the hills with specific views of landmarks in the city. So because our site was kind of um, buried within, within a, a dense urban fabric, you know, what just like on a hike when you get to the top of the hill, maybe you can see around a corner that you wouldn't normally have seen. And so we had about six, six or seven different landmarks from the different sides of the building. And then um, we thought about the material, which was going to be, you know, a concrete building. What if these different, what if the topography could be defined by the different strata, the different levels? Um, this is an image of, of the final building. You, you can see that you know, it, it is kind of within a context of a lot of other buildings today, but in the future when the whole design, when the whole uh, neighborhood is built out, there will be more and we knew exactly where they would be as well. So that was um, kind of the concept and the, these different contours related to the depth of the terraces that there would be on the building um, and the, the solar shading that they would get. So like strata, you know, in rock that is formed by water, wind, and time, 
these strata, we had to further define them, you know, for, for access, for sun shading, and for use and handicap accessibility, et cetera. So we applied those different criteria to it. And I don't think it would have been possible unless our tools, which are, you know, the digital connection between our tools in the studio connected to the tools on the job site, um, allowed us to do every single floor differently. And the other thing that we learned, I guess, about tall buildings, which is unique, is that they're really based on, the clients are very time sensitive, because, you know, if you think about adding four hours to each floor of an 82-story tower, you know, adds up to months, and that, that is adding up on the financing and all of those other criteria. So it had to be something that could be done relatively quickly. Um, we worked with the builders early on. They found the, a steel formwork that could bend into the shape of the contours, but then be reused on every floor. Um, and it was laid out with, you know, with this digital handheld equipment, similar to GPS, but um, really just taking our drawings and, and plotting out where the where the um, contour would be. The wind tunnel testing, you know, one one of the things that was I guess it was more of an instinct. We thought that the various floor levels would help reduce the, the wind uh, pressure or the, the discomfort from wind on the tower. And we were proved right in that. And so this, this is an, inside the wind tunnel. You, you really have to you model the entire area. And at the time we did aqua, there was like a long list of towers ahead of us. So we had to wait pretty long for our results. But it did turn out that. Um, the wind was confused by our various floor slabs, and, um, and it is it's something that you can actually feel when you, you go out onto these terraces. Some of them are as deep as 12-foot um, cantilevers. You, you, you actually feel pretty comfortable. You know, there are days when it's not comfortable, but um, it really does extend the use. And for us, it was kind of a primary um, goal was to make a tall building that people could actually inhabit the outside of it. You know, it's really very rare to find that and maybe even see your neighbors um you know obliquely instead of in the elevator <laughs> on their terraces uh, so these views that are created um and and that thrill of being in a tall building I, I think is something i didn't really grasp until you know we were building this and it was going up and you know and now i'm addicted i think <laughs> i mean like tall buildings um but they are also used by, this is a peregrine falcon that is the, one of the builders sent me a picture of. They, they like to perch high in these buildings. Uh, they, they feast on pigeons, thankfully. And, um, um, but they are, you know, you, this building actually, we got a PETA award for the building for, uh, because of the, the, the visual noise of the balconies, you know, as opposed to a very um, mirror-like reflective glass is more bird visible. But also, I think, and this one makes me a little nervous, but um, <laughs> kids, uh, there's, there's a group of explorers, you know, the urban explorers that, that don't have deserts and mountain ranges that use um, tall buildings as their end tunnels and things like that as their experimental uh, explorations. Uh, I'm glad I didn't know about that before I got the picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, these are some of the buildings we've been working on. These are, you know, there's probably about 10 projects here with lots of different options. But this is, like I said, this all of these different towers that we've done lately came out of things that we discovered in the first Aqua Tower um, project, which, and this was a morph morphological drawing of, of the, the, the kind of family tree, I guess, if you will, of, of some of the tower research. Um, of course, one of the trajectories had to do with solar and... Um, we are currently, uh, I mean, the, the balconies were giving shading to the glass. Um, you are losing some thermal, you're losing some heat in the winter, but it turns out it was about between 0.5 and 1% of the total energy use of the building. But we want to do better than that, and um, we started looking at carving, solar carving. Um, that is basically, I mean, it's an old thing. This is, this is, this is the New York uh, City um, zoning guidelines for um, the zoning envelope that you might remember from 1909, where they are saying, uh, giving an envelope to the architects and saying, 
um, you have to stay within this. And the whole idea of this is so that sunlight can get down to the street. Um, so, I mean, this is really interesting. And, you know, it became, it became even more important with the project that we are currently working on for the, um, it's called the Solar Car Power along the High Line in New York City. And um, these are some of the, the various models of this, this tower. The only thing is when you when you apply any principle, you have to look at the specifics, you know. And um, what we discovered, this is the envelope for the zoning that was allowed for our site. You can see the High Line moving along there. Um, we found out that if we built what was allowed on this site, and you can see it, this, this site is right along the West Side Highway and the Hudson River there. We would be basically putting the High Line into a lot of shadow um, and kind of, uh, in, in my view, is really detrimental to the experience of the High Line. And, and the reason why, you know, the High Line is different because it's, it's actually a public space that's in the middle of the block instead of a public space that's on the, on the street. And so what, what we did was, and this has not been approved yet, so <laughs> hopefully they'll let, we stepped it back off of the, um, <coughs> the High Line so that red space is the, the step back, um, put the volume up on top so we made a taller building, um, and then started carving it away to bring more light and views down to the High Line. Um, you know, I think the High Line, the, it's just gone ahead, it's been a, out in front of the zoning, so the zoning hasn't caught up to it. So this building is based on um, kind of taking it into our own hands and seeing what we could do with the solar carving. Um, this is a this kind of shows it from the other angle, and you can see how the, the sun um, is used and the views are used to shape the building. So that produced a pretty interesting building shape, actually, and not, not exactly easy to hold up either, <laughs> by the way. Um, but it was possible. We engineered this. So the corners are, are carved out, um, and you can see that wherever we carved it, there's a faceted glass. And then you can see the profile from the west side where it really is kind of getting thinner at the bottom. That's the tricky part. Um, so that's coming soon, hopefully. Um, and then finally, the, the Hyderabad O2 tower, which I'm going to zoom through. But you know, every, every place is specific. And here, we were asked to do a, a residential tower for Hyderabad, India, which is uh, South Central India with a very different climate. And in that case, we just started looking at how do people build in India or in other places with similar climates? Um, looking at what was really super interesting from this um, Swiss professor who had done a book on, on um, city streets. And, and um, you can see this, the self-shading that's going on. So, so in India, it's really important to um, use the volume of the building to shade. And, and you can see this with the courtyard housing. Uh, that's that's used uh, traditionally called the Habeli housing. Um, so we tried to see if it would be possible to blow that up bigger. Um, the project's called O2. Um, it's got a, um, a courtyard tower, which is actually um, four independent towers and then a low-rise structure. There, there's some of the first models. Um, and um, we were able to do a, a workshop with Doshi on this project, which was really interesting. He, he gave us advice, and, and he had really had a lot of interesting ideas about how, how uh, the building will be inhabited over time and changed. So we're using the, the, the shape to naturally ventilate up for the public spaces of the building. Um, here you can see the kind of interlocking. There's four different towers that interlock to create this courtyard where the cracks um, and public spaces in between are shaded and, and used. And then you can see a comparison with our, on ours on the right is the, the balcony structure on, along one of the cracks. And on the left is um, self-shaded street in India. Again, using a lot of these tools to help us figure this out. But at the same time, we realized that, you know, this, this was the most shocking thing. We saw people in India building um, sun with sun-dyed bricks in a lot of the structures. And it, it, it just it became a really an obsession for us. I mean, we found that you know, even though we talk about people moving to cities, about 40% of the world's population still lives in earthen homes. And, and how could we maybe take that and improve upon that for this project? 
Um, our site is very, it, it's, it's a very huge site that we were only doing a very small part of, about one and a half million square feet on P19 right there. Uh, but it was, it set itself up to be almost like you could make a factory doing dried, sun-dried bricks. And we found this uh, equipment that is being used in India to make compressed blocks. And these blocks, this, this would work great out here, actually. You, you don't have to fire them. Um, they have very good, um, very good ratios in terms of their strength. Um, so we bought one of those and brought it to IIT. So it's kind of like, you know, trying to innovate on this, this low tech end of the spectrum in order to improve what could be, you know, a lot of people's lives if 40% of the people live in these type of homes. Um, we tried some different additives working with the material science people at IIT and um, our, I think it's like it's an ongoing thing but we've made some interesting progress and that's what we want to use for our building in India. So to wrap up because I think I might be running over I'm going to just zoom through our some of the public engagement things. One is a, um, a book called Reverse Effect where we have done uh, some work with students at the Graduate School of Design uh, and, and ecologists to look at the potential of um, reestablishing a barrier in the, in the Chicago watershed. And the reason why is there's a lot of, it, this map shows the red is the canals that, that kind of so-called reverse the Chicago River. But the downside of that we're seeing today, 100 years later, with uh, polluted bad water quality, we have flooding in basements, we have invasive species coming up the Mississippi about to make their way into the Great Lakes, but it also the potential of the underutilized urban um, post-industrial land. The invasive species issue, we, we got funding from the Joyce Foundation and NRDC, Natural Resource Defense Council, to look at you know how could um, a barrier help prevent this. They are pretty big, big fish, and they, they could decimate you know a whole recreational industry as well as the native fish populations there. And they're pretty scary. I mean, this lady's really scared. <laughs> they're about forty to eighty pounds or something like that. Uh, filter feeding fish that would you know basically decimate the food um, chain for the native species there. So the students worked on some projects about creating a dam. We interviewed people that use the river today. And, and then came up with a set of, of steps of how to eventually get into the, where we could, you know, unreverse the Chicago River. Uh, that's what the space looks like now, where the dam would be along Bubbly Creek, and then gave the public some images to hang on to. Basically, it's, it's this book is really about advocacy for something, and we needed to bring, you know, people along. And th this is the image that we put out there as what the space, the potential of that space could be in the future. And then the last thing is uh, I just wanted to talk about the Prentice Hospital uh, project, which we recently completed. Well, it's not really a very big project. It was really more about bringing attention to the loss of, of an important building in Chicago. Um, maybe people know Bertrand Goldberg. He, he was um, a very important architect in, Chicago who did, he, was, he studied under Mies, but he um, really, the Marina City, uh, Hillard Homes, and Prentice are three of his most important projects. Um, it was built in 1974, and this building was, and I'm sure everybody can <coughs> relate to this, it was in, in danger of being um, torn down, uh, and so there was a movement to try to put this on the landmark, uh, national landmark status. Um, Incredible building. It's got these great cantilevers. He had a an open core in the center for um, the, its nurses to have sight lines to the different hospital rooms. Um, really innovative structurally, but it's on a site that the university wanted to build a new research uh, facility. So this fight started, I don't know, like two, more than two years ago, trying to bring awareness to this building. Um, um, and it, it was not going in a good way with, you know, the historic preservation kind of on one side and, and the university on the other who just wants to tear it down. Um, the, it, there was an opening, well, I guess the story is just that, you know, how can we as architects, 
you know, help with something like this. I mean, to me, it was really an important building. It's very inspirational. And um, um, I, I wrote a letter, and so did many other architects, and probably people in this room, too, to try to preserve this building. And, and one thing I really wanted to do was get this critic from the New York Times to write about this story, the way that he wrote about the Franklin Wright House out here, um, which I think was very, very good news on that front. Um, so I, he was in Chicago. I drove Michael Kimmelman to the site to show him the building. Um, and he was sitting there looking at it and said, you know, you're never going to win this one because they just, they're, they're going to need to make the value of that site much higher than, than the small building that's sitting on that. And um, he said, what about, you know, adding to it? And, and the, when he said that, it was just interesting to me because no one, nobody had really been talking about that. You know, it was either save it or tear it down. So he said, I said, I'm going to look at it. And then I, I worked with the historic preservation people to, you know, make sure that we weren't torpedoing any of their plans and they were really open. So we produced, um, and oh, the other good thing was that there was a, a, the center of this building, because he had pulled the cores out of the center, there was actually a lot of real estate right down the middle of this building that, you know, in a way it's kind of really <coughs> altering the building, but it would provide a chance to, to put a new core in it. Um, and so we came up with this drawing. Um, again, it's, it's only, it's, it's an image, but there was about a week of work of like talking with engineers, figuring out if it was possible. Um, um, and we put that uh, together with some other images. And then um, when the, the alderman came up with this saying that I'm, I'm leaning towards tearing it down unless there's a eureka moment, that's when um, Michael Kimmelman went to press, wrote the article, and published the image. And so this got a lot of people talking. I mean, it was it was great uh, movement at first along the lines of, you know, what, what could we potentially reuse this building? Almost like he was equivalent, he was, he was likening it to in Rome when you just build on top and the top and the top. And so uh, that got everyone talking. Um, I am sad to report though that last week they declined the landmark status. So we're probably going to lose this building after all. But I think, um, I guess the moral of the story is just like, now how do you define your practice? What do you focus on? You know, and, and can we uh, use our, our skills as architects to help with some other things that are outside of our own practice? Okay, with that, I thank you. And, um, <laughs> time for lunch. <laughs>